real quick and all right we're all good go ahead all right. hey everyone um so i had some dorky things to share today and i would just i'm just going to jump right into it the main things are uh some lamps that i like to build which is like basic electronics and that not even electronics electrics um, and then um, I've got some home automation stuff to show off. So I don't know if anyone has, does anyone have a home automation system or use any of that stuff at home? Bob does. Besides Jeff and Bob. Well, that's, hey, that's like 20% of the audience. Um, anyway, so I'll just, I'll just jump right into it. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to like tell this in a little bit of a story format to make it a little more interesting. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so I live out near Oregon, and um, when my mom purchased this property, I live in, I live with on, on her property. She built this art studio. So this is like the art studio, and over here in in the wing, there's a little I've set up a little workshop. And you know, I work at a computer all day, and I love to go down and and work in the shop and you know use my hands. So what I've kind of been taking to building is, um. I like taking like old like candle holders and vases and stuff and turning them into lamps. Um, this is one that's up by my desk. Uh, what's cool about this is that there's a like a, a like a touch, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, a touch switch in the base. So the entire thing, I can tap it and turn it on and off, which is super convenient. Um, so this is the first one that I did. I saw these, I saw these in like a, a secondhand shop in Stoughton or something and, and I picked them up. So and there's a pair of them. Uh, and ever since I made this one, it's like, I kind of like turning stuff into lamps. Um, so that was what kind of inspired me to do stuff. And here's a picture of uh, one that I just made recently. This was, a, thankfully it was metal and I routed, I guess, is it routing? I'm not sure, but I, I, I drilled out a hole and it was actually a pretty heavy, like a, a, there was a lot of metal in there, but I would drill the hole, just drill the hole out and uh, um, put, just put a, a simple old lamp in there. Um, and then there's a, another tiny de detail that might not even be worth mentioning, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna switch my, switch my camera here if I can. Stop my share. Um, I have this overhead camera on my desk so I can do so I can do drawings when I'm doing consulting work and stuff and switch back and forth. But I've got the lamp here and see if I can hold it in, in the camera. And then the other thing was just a little notch, just like uh, dremeling out a notch for the, I can't really show that very well, Drum, dremeling out a notch for the, um, for the cord. And I used heat shrink. I was really proud of myself. Okay. So that's the lamp. And the other lamp, which is a little more interesting, I think, is um, so there's so mom, my mom's an artist and there's all kinds of weird stuff down there in the studio and this this like glass sphere ball thing has just been sitting there for years and I was like oh you know what that should be a lamp right it's like badass uh, thick glass and really pretty um, so my initial plan I'm gonna share my screen again. My initial plan was to use these, I think it's called a Cobb LED. It's like a circuit on board LED. And uh, these came from uh, AliExpress for like two or three bucks, but they didn't have any kind of heat sink on them or anything. And I put this together, I kind of got it all mounted up. Um, here's a picture of it on a different base, but Eventually, I did manage to kind of get it all wired up, and like I, I, you know, I soldered soldered onto the the leads, which I guess we can't see in this picture. Yeah. So for contacts, it just has these little tiny contacts here. I don't know if that's big enough on the screen share. Um, but I used, you know, just regular old solder and dunk dunk and soldered it up, and finally I got it to work. Um, this video is about forty seconds long, and. This was like the first time that I'd got it to work and getting everything to like fit properly was actually a huge pain in the ass. Uh, so I was really proud of myself that I got it all to fit even though it looks like super dorky. Um, so I got, it, I got it fired up and I was taking a little video to send to a friend and about 30 seconds in, um, it just stopped working, turned off. And I wanna get to that moment here. Yeah, so it, it just turned itself off. 
And when I went in and looked into it, uh, apparently it got so hot that the solder point melted. So like one little heat sink was not sufficient to keep the solder from melting on the, uh, because of the heat generated by the cob LED. So I don't know if anyone's worked with LEDs, um, but I don't know if I need to put a fan on this thing, have like active cooling or what? Uh, so, okay, so that didn't work. So back to the drawing board. Well, it's not nearly as fun, but I guess I can turn it into a regular old lamp. And so I, I went to put another uh, standard lamp jack on there and stop my screen share again. Um, I was just gonna use a, like an Ikea bulb uh, Ikea smart bulb. So no problem. We'll just do that. Well, it didn't fit. So I had to like, this doesn't just pop off. I had to like really, really, really take it off of there. And um, this is the result of that. That's the top of the, I'm sorry, I'm not used to using the camera like this. Um, that this is the, the LED configuration of the bulb with the, with the top cut off. And it's also a smart bulb, which is kind of cool. So it's a smart lamp but that fits on and it goes like. You're muted now. Well, that happened. Thanks. Um, and so now I've got, let's see, can I cut over to this? Just one sec. Can you guys see that? No, you can't. So when it's actually in action, if you look at my other camera, am I still in the call? Yep, you're there. You just got to flip your uh, camera, oh, I think. Derp. Super derpy. Okay. There you go. Now you're good. Um, why can't I see that? For some reason, I can't see that 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 frame. It still says connecting to audio. Um... Yeah, it should be. It should be because my audio is coming through the main one. Um, there it is. Okay. So yeah, that's actually how it looks. Um, and well, I like it, except that I, I wish the bottom was illuminated more. I'm going to go back to the first camera and go like this. Um, can you pin the other one again, Chris? Yep. Yeah. Hang on. I think I just, uh, see if I broke it or not. There we go. How's that? Right, so, th so this is me just holding it sideways. The only bummer is I wish I wish more of the bottom was illuminated, like all the lights just shooting straight out, out and up. Um, and it's not really doing a very good job with the contrast, but the, the bottom is much darker than the top and I, I wish it was darker on the bottom. So that's it for that part. Uh, any, does anyone know anything about the, the cob LEDs <laughs> that can save me? Like, is it normal for those to get so hot that they melt their, the solder attached to them? I think that it is normal for them to get so hot, but, but normally they're not put in such a small c container without any airflow, but you can run them less brightly. Like, I don't. I think you can control how much current you drive them with. That's a good so idea. That's a, that one runs on 120 directly, right? Yep. Or 110 or whatever it says. So that's a, So you'd have to have an SCR, sure, to, to fire that there, a triac. Um, I think it'd be a pain. It's not like so a DC one. The driver's embedded in the thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's got a rectifier and a driver built in. I don't, it didn't look like that had another control line or anything. So um, they probably have, the, it'll be like a degrees per watt um, recommended uh, heat sink. So like the manufacturer probably gave you a data sheet or something someplace that'll say like, you need uh, X degrees per watt uh, heat sink to be coupled to. Um, ah, Bob's got a good point. I work on a dimmer switch. Um, maybe if it's dimmable. It, some of them aren't dimmable and some of them are so you could try that the and, only other thing i could say is uh if you use leaded solder it could be that if you use lead free you'll get a higher melting point well i, I know you'll get a higher melting point but it's not going to be that much higher right but and that might get it slightly if it's getting that hot though right and, and you fix that problem you're just going to push the problem somewhere else something else is going to melt that's probably true right well it's all metal and glass like so your house <laughs> yeah um yeah i had it kind of elevated to get to just let like airflow, just let the, the heat sink do its thing instead of having it be stuck in the ball. Um, but yeah, that's the, so if I, if I use, uh, if I use like a lower voltage with a dimmer, you're saying that 
that won't work because there you need to it needs to like pulse it or something like well so there's a 50 50 chance so some leds are dimmable and some of them aren't so like on bulbs when you buy a bulb it'll say like explicitly you know dimmable or not dimmable so if they are dimmable you can use a regular um wall dimmer and then that would work perfect um if it's not dimmable then it's just meant to be like you know some of those are used in outdoor lighting and so they're just meant to be on or off uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, so I'll you could check that. and see. It won't hurt anything to try it, as long as you don't try it for very long. If it if you run the dimmer and it doesn't turn on a little bit, then it's definitely not going to work. Uh, yeah. I don't like keep it plugged in because stuff will overheat because it's meant to meant to be getting full power. Part of it is I wanted to like blast this thing with so much light that it would be not just like an accent light, but like actually provide some illumination. <laughs> um, but the the IKEA bulb actually is is pretty good. It's I mean it's an LED and it's it's pretty freaking bright 12.5 watt led pretty bright um anyway cool thanks for letting me talk about that what camera do you have what, what camera am i looking at right now because like oh, it sure. looks way different than any webcam yeah so that, that's a great question so it is in fact i think i can do this and i'm yeah i'm happy to talk about my setup and stuff too um i'm gonna switch to my so this, this overhead camera is a Logitech Brio, which is just a $200 4K, fairly nice webcam. Um, but then on the computer, so that's the computer setup. Uh, what you're looking at here is a, um, let's see if I can get it from the side. Okay. Let's, can you, uh, Chris, can you pin the other, the, the, the other camera? There we go. Okay, so I know it's gonna be choppy. But this is, uh, what's it called? It's a Zcam E1, which is a 4K micro four thirds kind of jobby. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's more of like a legit like mirrorless style camera. And then there's a, a 12 millimeter lens on here, which is uh, fixed focal length and manual focus. So I just leave it focused on like the focal plane of my face. I get a little, little bokeh on back. Um, and then this thing on the front is a, um, okay, let's switch back to the first camera. This thing on the front is a, a teleprompter called a, it's like a parrot pad or something, padcaster, um, which is just a, a, it's, you're supposed to put your phone in there, but I wanted to have this, have the, the padcaster driven by a computer monitor. So there's like a four inch, five inch uh, LCD in here that just takes HDMI. Problem is that it's not flipped properly. So that's a problem I was trying to solve. And my current solution for that is to use a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, let's see if I can get that in. Just a Pi Zero. Uh, and in the config TXT for uh, Raspbian, you can, you can set the horizontal flip, which is something kind of cool. It's like really hard to do that on a lot of different computers. Um, and then I set this up as like an, like an AirPlay receiver and told my Mac, hey, extend your screen to this AirPlay device. So that's the current plan for getting the, the teleprompter working well. Mr. Marcus, do you have any better uh, ideas for how to flip HDMI? This is like Marcus does video formats all day. So I would imagine. I would, if... I would love to hear that. <laughs> Go ahead, sure. Oh, I'm just curious what this setup is for. Um, you know, hanging out. Um, I do a lot of YouTube, uh, mostly around, um, I'm, you know, I do consulting around uh, better ways to work and uh, holacracy, um, self-organization. So it's basically just like for YouTube. I mean, I've got a, I've got a light, a couple different lights in here, but you know, I'm, I'm lit. Sorry, I gotta switch back. Um, switch back to this. I'm probably going to be off kilter now too. Oh, I think I unplugged my, my camera. That's not going to uh, work. It's working. It's working it? for us anyway. Yeah, yeah you're all good. Okay. There I am. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got a little light up here and I got some lighting installed on a track light. Um, last year I was really active on YouTube and then the pandemic hit and I just kind of lost juice for it. Just got, just lost energy for it. I mean, everyone was talking about remote work and I just felt like I couldn't, like I was, I was talking into like a, a, a really loud room. Um, 
so this year I'm looking forward to getting back into doing more YouTube. Do you have anything else you wanted to share, Jonathan? Otherwise, we can take yeah. other questions. Um, yeah, so I was going to cut over to the home automation stuff. Um, unless anyone has anything they want to uh, talk about with regard to the elect electronics. Okay. Yeah, if you uh, want to, sh if you would later on want to mail out to the mailing list, like the specs on that thing, I imagine you can gather some some thoughts with how to heat sink it properly or what kind of heat sink you'd actually need. Yeah, and I'm at this point, I'm so sick of it. I'm like, <laughs> I, that's a great, that's a great option, and you know, like sector six six seven is a great resource. Uh, I may end up doing that. I'll also, I can also look it up on on AliExpress. Um, for now, I'm just happy to have it lit up and in, in my room and not burning anything down. I'm just curious to see if uh, it expects a heat sink about as big as the globe on the back with like a fan blowing. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. what, what did you buy? <laughs> I just I, it was it was going to be for my girlfriend's garden. Um, just for her to have like uh, like like lighting for the this little greenhouse, and I never ended up doing that, but I thought I would use it for this. Um, okay, home automation time. So I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, this is pretty El Dorco, but if you're into um, home automation stuff, let me. I'm gonna describe the problem first. So I really wanted to have um, my schedule on this little Echo Show here. And you can ask the Echo Show, hey, show me my schedule, and then it'll do it. But it won't display it in a, just an ambient way. Um, so that was frustrating. I was like, well, that sucks. Like it won't just, you can't just like turn on an option to you know, display my calendar on the home screen, which seems like a big oversight to me. Um, so, what I learned, so I have a, I have a, a home assistant running, which is a, like a home automation, open source home automation system. And here is a home assistant. Some of you may have seen it. And you can't trigger an Alexa routine directly from home assistant, but it turns out that you can create a, like a dummy, a dummy like device um, now I didn't think this. I didn't think of, think this part of the presentation through too far. Um, so what I was able to do was basically create an automation which would it. What it does is it uh, on a certain time pattern. This is like a Unix style cron, cron. Right now it's set to one minute, just for the demo. Every minute, what it does is it calls a service to toggle a virtual input Boolean twice. So it turns it off and then back on. And then the input Boolean is hooked up to this like thing called the template sensor. And then that can get exposed to Home Assist, to, to Alexa. So the Echo sees this thing turn on and off. It's being turned on and off by Home Assistant on a cron job. And then from there in the Alexa app, you can uh, use that as the trigger for uh, a routine. And then the routine just does the show me my calendar thing. Um, so that's all great, except that it would be talking to me every time it showed the calendar. So this is my favorite part of this hack. Um, switch camera back to, nope, nope, switch camera back to the Brio. Um, so if we kind of try to get the, that in fiction. So my, my favorite part of this hack is I just plugged in a, an, uh, an eighth inch and it just prevents it from, sorry. I, I just plugged in an eighth inch plug, just a dummy one. And it, uh, it prevents the Alexa from making any noise. It just talks, it's trying to talk through the plug and there's nothing, it's not going anywhere. So it's essentially a mute, a mute Alexa, a mute echo, um, but it does the job. It's, you know, it's showing me, here's my, you know, here's my calendar event for the day. Um, and if I let it sit here, it'll, Every 10 minutes, it'll just show me what's up on my next couple of appointments, um, which is great because I can't always keep, keep it straight. Uh, and it's pretty. That's that. Any questions or, or thoughts about uh, home assistant or home automation? You know, I thought for sure I was uh, missing out on a 
on home automation stuff by now because I figured by now, you know, it's been out long enough. People have, have got enough cool home automation things built that it's got to be stupid enough for me, a mechanical engineer with zero software knowledge to figure out and use. But you've single-handedly demonstrated that it has not hit the polish point yet, that it just functions. For you. This, is, this is such a weird little obscure thing. Um, and I even went out and I bought like a, a the Google one and like had that going, which is really beautiful. The, the Google screen uh, i forget what it's called but the google the google screen home assistant is much much nicer than the than the amazon ones um but a lot of other stuff just works and it makes sense home assistant's great the open source stuff is is killer it was just this one thing i had to like dance around in circles and like so I don't know. yeah i just it's uh it's too bad there are so many, like you said, there's different platforms with different companies and they, they have their own internal stuff. And then, I don't know, I've got no trust in Google because Google buys stuff and then they just murder it like two years later and like, oh, you don't have any API and oh, we're never going to release any of that stuff. And eh, I mean, everybody's over this. I mean, it's at least two years old. It's all junk now. Right. Um, it just seems like that happens so, so yeah. often. And then the open source stuff glues together some things and then other companies won't behave within that environment or some things work and don't yeah, work. Yeah, so most of it, um, um, most of it works like, like I'm trying to type and talk at the same time. And I'm tired, that's not smart. Tasmota um, Home Assistant. Most of the stuff uh, works fairly seamlessly. And then there's this great thing called Tasmota, which is, um, let's see. So a lot of these smart switches run on a, an ESP8266, um, which is a little microcontroller. And this Tasmoda uh, open source if it's open source firmware, if you can flash this on like a smart plug or a sensor, it basically gives you access to all the GPIO pins on the device. Um, and it also runs a protocol called MQTT, which is like a I'm not super familiar with it, but it's it's some kind of like a broadcast, uh, like local network broadcast push thing. Um, so if you wire if if you get stuff that's compatible with Tesmoda, and you want to put put Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi, you can have a lot of fun. Um, let me show you my list of uh, entities here. Um, so I don't have like a lot of stuff going on, but um it's a pretty big list of like sensors and various crap and you guys probably can't even read it sorry about that um that so it's it's fun to play with but it's not really it's not terribly practical it's like i have to find excuses to use it um i'm, I'm trying to get it set up so my dishwasher and like washer dryer will text me when they're done or like um it'll like like when my mom starts the dishwasher when it's done it'll like text my girlfriend to unload it and then like i want I'm, I'm trying to solve all of these issues with like a dirty kitchen using absurd amounts of technology instead of just like having a conversation or something automate the humans that's right yeah if only uh that's about all, all right. i got Marcus, you got any HDMI uh, suggestions for the teleprompter flipping? Uh, I, no, I don't really have a good suggestion on um, flipping the image. I, I'm just wondering, I mean, why wouldn't you just use the Raspberry Pi to provide the content for the teleprompter? Because I want to be able to, um, that's a great question. Uh, I want to be able to also use it for, um, for Zoom. So I want to be able to take whoever I'm talking to and move them up onto the camera so I can actually look in their eyes and have a conversation with them and be more connected to the people on my, on my conference calls. So, and I also don't want to have to like switch back and forth between one device and another and, you know, KVM, this and that. And, um, and I also think it's super badass when, when you're looking at your uh, desktop configuration, the, the display layout, I can show, share my screen for one more sec here. Um, you know, when you're looking at this and you've just got like monitors everywhere, I, I enjoy that. So before I had a little, when this was hooked up, I had a little monitor right above that. Um, 
and yeah, just the ability to like push a window up there, I think is pretty cool. So what do you run to turn the uh, Raspberry Pi into an uh, AirPlay receiver? Um, I forget the name of it. Let's see, am I still sharing? Zoom. Um, it's something, it's something with a pretty, like, like kind of like a name you would expect. Um, air, airplay receiver, uh, Raspbian. Um, but basically it's just a process that you run yeah, sure, sure. SharePoint sync. Is that it? Some of them are, are audio, some of them are video, but there's, there's somebody who wrote a, um, who wrote a thing to do it. So the, there is like, uh, you can buy um, a, like a $10 capture device that has HDMI on uh, one side and um, USB um, on the other side. So you plug your HDMI in and what, it, what the thing does, it brings basically the video feed into your computer. Now you could then on the Raspberry Pi uh, flip it and then send it um, to the HDMI. You could do that. That's a good idea. That did not occur to me. And I've got a, I've got like a handful of those HDMI dongles. Um, right, and they've been selling them now for like ten bucks, which is unheard of. You know? Yeah, it, yeah, it's great. It's so nice, especially when they were so hard to get for a while. That is a good thought. Um, thank you. I just might do that. Um, I also have another, a little bit larger um, uh, LCD monitor that I want to, I, I, I kind of wish this, this teleprompter was bigger. So if I was on a call with like a dozen people, I could do gallery view and kind of see them all. Um, but this other one that I've got, I don't have it here to show, but it has a, um, on its on-screen display, it actually has a flip horizontal function. And that's great. Like that's, I don't even need a Raspberry, I don't need a Raspberry Pi, I don't need anything. It just, it has the flip in the hardware, but I, I'm all over AliExpress and I can't find anything that describes like any other controllers. I can't figure out like which controllers have this OSD that lets you do flip horizontal, flip vertical. Um, I was going to say the, the irony here is thick in that all you need is a, a projector because then the projectors have a rear projection mode. So you could project onto a half, half mirror um, uh -huh. and then you can flip it any way you want, but now you've got to have a projector and a bunch of, but I don't know. I mean, right. they got some of those tiny, uh, led projectors. I don't know whether one of those would work, but they definitely have mirroring, you know, yeah, built in. that that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Just to add to the fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's... my guess is that the screens that are derived from perhaps, uh, either reverse um, displays or something like that might have, might may have that built in as a feature because it's derived from the projector stuff. Um, yeah, otherwise Matt just added a, a comment that VLC can probably do it too, uh, built in as a filter. I do have to say when I was working on my arcade game uh, that runs off a of Raspberry Pi, it had lots of uh, rearranging of the screen and flipping it back and forth and mirroring it. So that was, yeah, Retro, Retro Pi, Retro Pi, I think it was the OS. So, yeah, even in the I, this blew me kind of kind of blew me away. I guess it's not that amazing, but in the there's a config.txt file that um, Raspberry Pi reads even before it boots into the OS. I think, or it's something in the early stages of of Linux boot, but that has uh, some. You can configure some settings in there to like load modules and change configuration. And one of those things you can do there is just flip it so. The whole machine is just flipped uh, horizontally for its, you know, for its entire run life, and it doesn't even know it is. I think. Um, yeah. Cool. Does anybody else have any questions for Jonathan or anything? I'm just waiting till uh, the refrigerators and freezers all have uh, MQTT built in, and like that part will crap out like the whole oh, whole fridge goes in the garbage because the thing doesn't work anymore. <laughs> there, was, there, there was some story about a, a smart oven that like had a bug or something and like all the smart ovens in the US went on broil at the same time or something. Yep, I remember reading about that. There was, yeah, there was some bug with something and yeah, they'd all kick on at the same time, which has <laughs> gotta be awesome. I'm sure if you store your Rubbermaids in there that uh, would go well. Yeah. 
I've heard that's even a, a potential vector for like a cyber attack is to like stress the power grid by turning everything on at once. Yeah, there's uh, stress the power grid, stress the uh, fire department. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, somebody was talking the attack vector on 3D printers was to try and overheat the bed and uh, try to light the printer on fire. But I don't know if anybody's run their 3D printer and like tried to set the temperature above just barely over what it was designed for. But they like the silicone pad heaters that are really rare on printers, those will go ungodly hot. But the regular like resistive PCB heaters, they barely even get hot enough to do anything as it is. Um, but that was somebody was claiming like, well, 3D printers connected to the internet are terrible because you'll burn your house down because the stuff isn't secured. And I, admittedly, I go ahead, sure. I thought most of the 3D printer fires were like those uh, poorly designed boards where like the MOSFETs would essentially overheat or the, the traces would be poorly designed. Or the power supply melts itself down. It has nothing to do with the printer. Yeah, there's, it's anyway, but yeah, there's there's uh, definitely some creative uh, writing going around how to how to light things on fire, which could happen in a very certain circumstance, but it's not like gonna light fires across the US or anything crazy anytime soon anyway. Not like not like running uh cob LEDs without heat sinks. <laughs> yeah, it's a special kind of fire there. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately the old school glass globe you'll be uh, reasonably safe from. But if right. you get one of those nice modern plastic uh HDPE globes, it'll probably just melt into a ball in a few seconds. So no big deal. Wow. Well yeah, thanks think- Jonathan for sure and that's awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for letting me let me ramble for forty five minutes. I have one quick question since 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 you guys are all here, um, it just occurred to me. Uh, I got I got to go grab him. One 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 second. <laughs> uh, so while Jonathan's grabbing that, Jeff, do you want to go next? And is there anything that you need to get ready or? Oh uh, no, the only problem I've got is my router seems to choke on Zoom, so I drop out every like few minutes for like five seconds. I don't know if that's gonna affect the presentation we'll find out sounds like it sounds like we'll give it a shot and see what happens all right go ahead jonathan you're good oh i i'm happy to wait until the end too no you're fine this is an easy one so i had this lamp this is just a like a desk lamp okay i'm gonna hold it up to the camera just like a desk lamp just a stupid little thing i think those are halogens in there but when i took it apart i discovered this massive I don't know what it is. Toroidal um, transformer. Toroidal, yeah. Toro- yeah, yeah. It's a so it's a, this is just a transformer to to take down the the voltage for the light bulbs or something, or the current. Uh, why why this so big? <laughs> like, quality. Yeah, it's, it's quality, older. and it's to keep you from uh, prematurely killing your bulbs. I bet so it smooths the it makes the power like really consistent. Um, so you see those all the time mm. in uh, medical devices. Um, where they use toroidal transformers because they do a better job outputting than a traditional transformer, like a big square brick guy. Um, so I would bet it might make the light bulbs last a lot longer because they'd be, it'd be more likely to smooth out uh, random blips from your power. You know, when your dishwasher kicks on and the dryer kicks on and everything else kicks on, your power kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. And I bet that screws up halogen bulbs more often than other things. But I, I, that's totally speculation. I might be totally wrong. And I just saw that it says uh, uh, 12 volt, 4.16 amp out, output. Is Could I replace this with like a little transistorized one pretty easily? Or I guess it's not transistorized, but whatever, a cheapie. The, I don't know if a halogen will run off of a DC or if it's got to be AC, because that would be putting out AC power. No shit. So don't. I don't know if a halogen bulb would run on DC power or not. Well, my, my plan for this is to replace, replace these with LEDs anyway. Um, oh, okay. Well then. Yeah. I just thought it's like, I haven't seen anything this big in ever. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for answering that. Toroidal transformer. There's a possibility. Does that like fit in the light base or something? I mean, maybe yeah. it's just for, for uh, the fit. They didn't want to go with the traditional square transformer. Yeah, it, I mean, it was, it does, it does fit in the base, and it gives it a really nice weight. Like, it's a really nice aesthetic um, to have that weight in there. But the plan for this is to mount it over the monitor so I can get some light without having to have overhead lights on at night. Do a little mood lighting in the office. I bet they went with that just for form factor, just to fit under the housing. Oh, would it, would another one be bigger? 
Would it? Well, it'd be square, so it wouldn't fit. Because it'd be a, a brick rather than a round. Interesting. There are. I bet that's literally the only reason they did that. We have very large round uh, Toroidal like you know, transformers in our benchtop power supplies. Right? We the, I didn't want to buy the cheaper ones, which are um, switch mode. So we went with more slightly more expensive, like middle of the uh, way ones, and they have like a, it's about this big. It's a you know really large uh, winding. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Jeff, you want to take it away? Okay, uh, come through all right. Um, however, it's going here. Um, yeah, I just saw I've been tying up some Sector 67 equipment for the last uh, three quarters of a year or so, and I uh, thought I'd explain it to everybody or uh, explain it at least to Chris here and let the else judge whether it's useful. Um, I've uh, basically moved to a place about a year ago, got some friends together. Um, we were planning to find a place. I wanted a place with a garage. I got a friend that wanted to start like a restaurant type of supper club with farm to table stuff. Uh, so we thought we'd like cooperate here together and a third guy. Uh, moved to the east side by Starkweather Creek, a Garver feed mill area and um, found this old house, kind of a 70s cookie cutter house. Uh, not much to it, but it's just some place to like uh, hang out for a year and uh, needed to fix it up a little customized stuff um, came across um, leaning a bunch, bunch of um, wood from a, a CSA so I've got all this like barn wood that I just like claimed from a burn pile I was going to get burned and figured I'd use that for a lot of building materials so um, I'll just start with what I got um, basically what kind of got me hooked was uh, coming to a uh, uh, moving over here, I'm near Sector 67, so I'm like, oh, moving from out of town, it's like uh, great to be able to have access to stuff. And then, um, bam, COVID hits a month after I move in. So, uh, Chris says I can borrow equipment. And uh, the main thing I came across was the Craig tool that um, seemed to be like a general thing just for uh, making a lot of wood joinery, um, pretty much putting together basic wood stuff. So, uh, I've got the barn wood, I've got a jig, a Craig jig, and I inherited some tools along the way, put together some tools of my own. And uh, the first thing I want to do was basically a good bed here. Um, so I made a loft to uh, make the room, bedroom that's kind of small, fit a lot of junk I have. So let's see, I can reverse this by, there we go. Um, so basically the first thing to base it all off, I put just like a cleat along the wall, two by four, um, all along the side there. And then took the barn wood two by fours, um, to build a frame. And I'm just kind of experimenting with, um, what I could do with a futon to like not take up a lot of, uh, thickness. Sorry about the rotations here. Uh, and uh, just kind of like made a basic frame and put slats across it. And uh, of course, slats uh, being pine wood, I uh, didn't have anything good to uh, use for that from the barn wood. So it was a little too, uh, didn't support itself, needed some cross bracing. So I'm just like experimenting, teaching myself joinery, um, what it takes to like drill into studs and put the cleat in the wall. Um, I don't know if anybody spots like, basic common mistakes. Uh, this is very, very simple uh, woodwork, I guess, but uh, um, yeah, it's been enough to um, <laughs> work as a bed. It's not real comfortable, a little thin futon on top of there, but uh, I'm pretty happy with the way it used up the space and uh, building a little uh, space at the end here with uh, shelving uh, for just storing boots and stuff like that. And a way to get up in the loft. Um, Definitely over over constructed it, so it takes the weight of climbing up it pretty well. Uh, so that was I also borrowed some sanding equipment from a sector. Uh, I didn't use the pocket tool for too much. I think a few things in here uh, the Craig Craig jig helped with, but otherwise it's just a lot of uh, basic screws in the ends of stuff. Um, but that was made the bedroom work a lot better. A lot of room, relative space underneath it. Uh, and then I did a few other things around the house. Bought some wood, resalvaged some uh, some stuff. And we took out uh, there was like 
wicker shelving in the bathroom that was like collecting dust and one of the roommates is asthmatic. So he was like reacting to it. Uh, so yeah, just experimented with basic. Didn't want to like build something fancy that would be removable. This is just all straight into the studs in the wall. Um, pockets for the baseboard on top, pocket stuff. And another one over here for little stuff just to make a big, something that looks like it fits with the basic woodwork. Uh, and then I, along with the uh, the theme of making a, uh, making this into like a supper club type thing, or it's supposed to be a bar table, which would go like in the middle and divide the kitchen from the front of the house here. Um, so this was like made from scratch, just following plans I found online for like a high, high, something to do with a bar stool. You could stand at it, sit at it. Um, this was where the Craig tool came in handy for a lot of the uh, pocket work. Um, pretty much all this is put together with the Craig jig. And uh, not the most kind of pine, it's pine wood, so it's lightweight, but uh, gets the job done for if we had actually had people over and hanging out, it'd be a great spot. Not happening too much. Uh, another spot was to expand the kitchen with uh, with rack space. So these two shelves, uh, ones I just put in a couple weeks ago, uh, made from scratch, something to support, get a lot of stuff off the counters and free up our counters. And uh, figure out a way to get a big dowel across, use some, uh, is a shower curtains, rods, um, what do you call them, hangers? Just to hang from hooks from for uh, pots. So uh, the kitchen, my friend that wants to be a chef thought this was pretty cool at least. So got pretty successful with that. Um, and then finally, one other location. Uh, well, we got the entryway. Uh, really tight space here, so I had to make something custom just to put in a place to kind of sit and change boots, and then a place to drain it. So I put in a, uh, just an angular thing to kind of all drain uh, wet boots, keep it from puddling up or something like that on the ground, and store some shoes and stuff like that. Set stuff by the door. Uh, up here, I'm going to put in a, now I'm going to put in um, like a coat hanger. And a shelf and like a little uh, station for like mail and stuff like that. Um, that's getting worked on. And uh, this is the main reason I moved here is because most places like uh, around campus and stuff like that is basically no garage and any cheap rental. So convince these guys move into a place and give me the garage. So I've got a place for motorcycles and workbenches and stuff like this building up plenty of lumber um, but this is the what i just did for the coat rack uh, cutting up dowels drilling angle holes you know making up stuff as i go um, the first thing i need to do was work benches out here so i got this cool one found a model online with uh, from a craig site i think uh, this is very um thinking of using this whole space Right now it's motorcycle uh, workshop mostly, bicycles, uh, woodworking, but if I ever need to get a car in here and work on it, uh, I didn't want to take up all the space with workbenches. Um, we've got hung the bikes up so that they can be swung over, kind of uh, make more room. They don't, have to, they don't have to come out and take up the whole space. And uh, the workbench here, let me see if I can just get an angle on this, but... Uh, I got these hinges, can you see? All right, uh, the only thing I bought, well, I bought some the lumber up north at a cool lumber yard I found that had sustainable forestry certification. Uh, this is all the two by sixes or two by eights are barn wood re reclaimed and uh, kind of pieced together in a tabletop with a pocket tool, um, pocket, pocket work, what do they call those, the jig, Craig jig. Um, but then I bought uh, just these two hinges from a um, hardware store online and they work with the two by fours so that uh, if I need the space, um, I think 
I need a hip cam or something here. There we go. And uh, I guess I got the those two hinges and this big piano hinge kind of made it off. So basically it frees up this whole area to easily park a car in here and have access to like open the door and not really be climbing and bumping into stuff. Um, this is also is the main workbench. Uh, this is the workhorse that's um, like overbuilt. Uh, can set, probably set the whole motorcycle on this thing if I needed to. Um, but again, it's all the uh, same, same deal with, uh, this is all the barn wood. I was able to claim uh, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens and uh, piece together. This is pocket tools just to make them into a tabletop. It's not the smoothest thing, but uh, it's plenty sturdy. So uh, overbuilt that. And uh, I guess the last part of this, I put the top shelf in. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of junk in there from my garage. This is obviously why I needed a garage. But uh, the other feature here is uh, Chris got me hooked on uh, the whole Ryobi uh, one, uh, one Plus battery system. So I've picked up a bunch of tools at uh, on the place at uh, Johnson Creek. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like crack, I guess, or something like that. But uh, a whole lot of... Uh, tools to go with a few batteries so i feel like i um yeah got a nice little spot here for a month uh for, for the year and uh lumber storage in the roof but uh that's pretty much what i've done with my uh sector 67 related work here um I'm not getting any audio on this thing. Is this still? Yeah, you're still okay. good. Cool. Does anybody have uh, questions, thoughts, ideas? Jeff, there's a couple of messages people typed oh. in uh, while you were wandering around, but nothing, nothing too crazy. Anybody have anything they wanted to share? It looks like you've been busy keeping yourself sane. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the plan was to be here, oops. Uh, yeah, and have a little uh, big social scene going because of the kitchen stuff and uh, have our friends over, do the farm to table stuff. And uh, that, uh, if we would have gotten it going like a few months early, that might've been a way to actually keep a little pot of people going. But uh, at this point, it's just kind of like not getting people together. It's fire, fire pit in the backyard because we're on Starkweather Creek, but uh, that's about all we can cope for. Yeah, it's a tough, tough time of year, especially to, you know, have moved here relatively recently. There's a lot of people looking to try and make make friends and reach out to people. And it's really hard just because people are trying to be good and conservative and, and uh, protect everybody. But in the same sense, it's it's not great to sit at home and stare at the wall all the time, which I think uh, I think everyone would agree with. Yeah, I live just a couple blocks from you, Jeff. And uh... I've got a uh, 16 inch uh, floor mount drill press. If okay. you're, not, uh, you're welcome. We can find a way for you to come over here and use it safely. Yeah, drill press, I've been coming across. It's like, I just don't want to buy more. I've got a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got this a long time ago, not a good deal. So it's, it's moved with me since. Awesome. And it's not easy to move. <laughs> It's they're really easy to tip over, but they're hard to move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, uh, I had to bring it up here. My girlfriend's Honda Fit, so I figured out how to take it apart. But, but um, yeah, that was that was a uh, that was a pivotal point in our relationship when she saw me walking down into the basement with that and setting it up. And she figured that this was going this relationship was probably going to last for better. Or she's going to own the drill press because you won't want to walk it back out again. One of the two. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jeff, thanks for sharing all your projects. It's uh, It looks like you've really done a, a lot of real small things that all tie together to make your whole space a lot more functional because that's, that's a lot of room for sure. Yeah, getting gratitude from the roommates for uh, housemates for kicking in that kind of stuff and enjoy the customization. But uh, thanks for yeah, the no, tools. Yeah, nice. 
Yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, I got a, um, I'll share uh, some stuff with the, um, trying to figure out why our Wi-Fi is periodically not working. And uh, basically uh, the other day we were doing a sci-fi Sunday and we had the whole set of people on Zoom. And I think Jim walked into the kitchen. Uh, so it's Jim and I and Heather are here and Jim hits the, I can hear the microwave beep and then all of the video pauses and then the whole like stream for Zoom all gets knocked down and like everything comes to a screeching halt and it dawned on me. So Heather had, had complained like that I was in the welding shop killing her Wi-Fi uh, often and I was trying to figure out like what was I doing that was killing the Wi-Fi because nothing anymore really should take the Wi-Fi out as far as tools or anything go because our power is a lot more stable. And it dawned on me when Jim nuked the internet, literally, that uh, she was probably seeing the every time the microwave turned on that it was killing the Wi-Fi because she's on uh, 2.4 gigahertz instead of 5.8. Um, and so it, it, I started thinking about like, well, I should I should see if I can figure out uh, what's going on with the microwave and why it's misbehaving um, or if it's actually misbehaving or not. So let me uh, try to get my zoom here to cooperate uh i'm gonna share my screen which will be for a second else think let's see how this works so you guys should be able to see in a second um some powerpoint slides if if this decides to behave all right is that working can we yeah, see yeah, looks, looks good hunting down Wi-Fi. Awesome, because I can still see you and other things. Um, so uh, essentially, turn on the microwave, uh, Zoom got murdered. Prior to that, we'd never really noticed uh, the microwave doing anything. It, it always seemed to work fine. And I think it's just eating more bandwidth uh, is causing you know it to be notable. So the two choices were, of course, to hit up eBay. And uh, this top left thing is this like, 1990s microwave leak detector. And so for $12, you can buy a thing that has no batteries, no technology, anything at all. It's just a, a gauge. And I imagine the leaking microwave frequency is enough to power the gauge to indicate uh, power density per area. Uh, and so I looked at this thing and thought for $12, I'm going to buy this thing and I'm gonna find out that our microwave is well within the legal limits of leakage. It's just leaking enough to, to kill off the Wi-Fi. Because in looking around online, it sounds like this is a, a really common thing. Um, so I didn't really want to buy a tool that I didn't think was really going to show me a whole lot. Uh, the other thing, I guess, as a, as a uh, little bit of background on microwaves themselves, microwaves are, are 2.45 gigahertz frequency, which is like smack dab right in the middle of uh, Wi-Fi wireless uh, spectrum. And so the reason that Wi-Fi spectrum is Wi-Fi spectrum is that it wasn't deemed to be usable for like any other radio, uh, like productive things. And so more or less a long time ago, they decided like, well, 2.4 gigahertz is totally worthless because it gets absorbed by everything. And so we'll just use that as this uh, open spectrum, which is why Wi-Fi ended up on Wi-Fi. Uh, but the reason that uh, micros run at 2.45 is because it makes water molecules spin really fast. And it lands in this nice open band of uh, uh, frequency. So anyway, uh, this thing at the bottom right is a software-defined radio. So I already had one of these. So I decided, well, the software-defined radio, I should be able to see like the radio spectrum, and I should be able to get this thing to work. So I went upstairs and dug out my software-defined radio and plugged it in and tried to tune to 2.4 gigahertz, and it didn't work at all because it only goes to uh, 1.75 gigahertz down here at the bottom. So kind of like Jonathan was talking about that ESP chip, uh, somebody realized that this RTL chipset, this Realtek chipset was a generic uh, tuner. So it, it gathered in analog spectrum and you could do digital things with it on a computer. And it did so um, reasonably well to be able to capture a pretty broad spectrum of data. And so this, became like this really cheap chipset that opened up this idea of making a software defined radio that's essentially just gathering in analog firing flying over the waves and turning it into digital something that you can see on the computer. Um, so then I started poking around online and trying to figure out like, well, what's a way that I can see 2.4 gigahertz without having to buy a several hundred dollar software defined radio to look at this thing. 
it turns out that all your uh, satellite TV um, receivers run at like two to four gigahertz on the downlink. And then once it gets inside your house, it's like 400 megahertz. And so you can go online and you can find these things. And so I found one. My goal is to be cheaper than the microwave leak detector. I failed slightly. This is a few dollars more expensive, but I thought this would be way more usable than having a tool that I'd use once because now if I have this thing, it'll take 2.4 gigahertz and drop it into like 400 megahertz uh, and to be able to see kind of what's going on. The first problem was um, the manufacturer of this thing is supposed to be uh, 2.7 gigahertz in and 408 megahertz out. So I had to make this little calculator to figure out what to tune my software defined radio to in order for it to see the correct corrected spectrum that I thought I was actually seeing. Um, so this is the setup. Uh, the thing in the yellow box is a software defined radio. It's got USB on one side and it goes out RF. The thing in the orange box is a, a power supply. So it's like a 21 volt power supply that's powering this active antenna. And then the blue box is that down converter. And so on the top of it is the antenna. It's gathering in the two-ish gigahertz spectrum and then dumping it into like the 400 to 700 megahertz uh, frequency that our software defined radio can understand. So the first problem when we fired this thing up is that there was this big band in the middle and that, that band in the middle, you can see across the red brake line doesn't shift. So I tuned the radio and I shifted the tuning. And so all of the radio spectrum should shift. The thing in the middle is noise of some kind. I'm not sure if I'm overpowering the antenna or if we're just getting noise on the software defined radio itself because these are like $20 devices. We don't expect them to be perfect. So anyway, the thing at the right is a real signal and all these other things are real signals, but this band in the middle, you kind of have to ignore because that's got some noise going on. Um, probably, uh, well, I'll, we'll jump back to what this interface is and how it works at the end. So this is just what the sector wireless noise looks like. So these vertical bands are uh, Wi-Fi data. Now, there's a lot of hand waving here, which is what I was joking about when Chris came in, because Chris is into amateur radio stuff. Uh, this is, uh, we're doing like a bad thing. We're taking a thing that's supposed to monitor frequencies way lower than it is, and we're doubling it. And then we're trying to read things that are actually way in the noise of what this is capable of. So long story short, we're, uh, we're I'm like taking frequency that it's not supposed to be able to read and then I'm trying to read really small stuff there. Uh, so it's not, not expected to work very bad, not work very well. But this is what it looks like when the network's up. And so you can see these little dots. Those little dots, as best as I can tell, are data packets that are coming in or out on Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi radios kind of operate as like packets or discretized data. And so this thing is called a waterfall. And so you're seeing time uh, vertically, frequency horizontally, and then amplitude is coming out at us as a color uh, frequency. So white is like hot, meaning really strong signal. And the blue is like kind of the background noise that's in the room. And down at the bottom here in the middle, this kind of greenish bluish thing with the spikes in it, these are the, um, this is like a, a discretized uh, time uh, slice through this uh, waterfall. So you're seeing the spikes as the data is coming across. So I went upstairs and I turned off the network, um, which is the most productive that anyone ever is at the shop is when the network doesn't work. Uh, so you can sort of see, I'll jump back and forth between slides. You can see where um, the data is no longer present. Like that strong data channel that was there is gone. You can still see though that we've got this other band at a, a, a it's 371 megahertz, which again, that's like in the Wi-Fi band. I don't know if that's some neighboring uh, like house or if it's a device in the building that's not on our network. I think I've killed off all of the random Wi-Fi things that Brian left around as like a treasure hunt uh, that were all over the building. But uh, at any rate, something else is still generating um, something that's in like the channel 10 or channel 11 and the 2.4 gigahertz band. I don't know what it is, but either way we can see that we can see a change. So at this point, I just wanted to prove out like, is this thing doing anything or am I just seeing garbage? So I put my phone really close to this thing and uh, I turned on the Wi-Fi and turned off the Wi-Fi on 5.8 gigahertz. And you can see these really big bands of splash. And the reason this is spread so widely across frequency is because I'm overblowing uh, the radio. So I'm putting my phone right next to the antenna 
and I'm telling it turn on, turn off. And so it's just like dumping really strong signal into the antenna just to make sure that I can really see something. I wanna make sure that this thing's actually working. The only interesting part is we're seeing a reflected duplicate signal. So I think our antenna down conversion process going into the software to find radio is mirroring some of the spectrum. So we can't really um, believe everything that we're seeing, but the point is we can see something. So that's valuable. I did the same thing with uh, 2.4 gigahertz, turning it on and off, and we can see the same type of an effect where those channels show up. There's a bunch of aliasing and some other goofy stuff going on, or if I tune up and down very slightly, sometimes the signals will disappear, sometimes they'll come back stronger. So it's, it, it's uh, like I said, there's some hand waving here, certainly. Uh, but when we turn on the microwave, we get this thing. So this is again, all sorts of aliasing where we're seeing a really broad pattern of, of uh, just spectrum just getting dumped on. So you can see with 2.4 gigahertz on, we've got these really discrete, very tightly controlled data packets. And when you turn on the microwave, you've got frequency flying all over hell uh, and a lot of power. And so it makes sense to us why we're murdering the, the Wi-Fi is because there's all sorts of uh, power all over the place. Um, so there's two microwaves here. There's a big microwave and a little microwave. So this is ironically the little microwave, uh, which is leaking a lot more uh, versus the big microwave. It's harder to tell, but this is kind of this like faint kind of bluish ghosty looking thing. That's kind of what the big microwave does. Uh, ironically, the big microwave does a much better job of destroying the Wi-Fi than the little one does. So I'm not entirely sure how to explain that. But so this red line here is when I turn the microwave on. So you can see above the red line, this is that Wi-Fi data uh, happily doing its thing. And then below the red line, you can see it gets really drowned out and it's just kind of falling into the background. So we can definitely see um, where we're getting some kind of effect that's actually measurable. Um, I shouldn't say measurable, visible. And so that's kind of the point is like, if I turn off the, the microwave here, you can see where we had this sort of sporadic data and also these patterns of RF noise that we're seeing. And then all this, the sporadic RF noise goes away. We start to see the background uh, RF noise. And then we can see all the data channels come back in again. So we've definitely uh, um, corroborated that the microwave is doing bad things to the radio frequency in uh, the building. And uh, that's sort of the next, the next thing to look at is uh, whether to care about that or not. <laughs> so don't stick your face really close to the microwave. Probably good, uh, good rule for life. But uh, Jim and I did look it up. If you do stick your face really close to the microwave, it's going to heat you up about a centimeter in. So it's going to heat you about a finger deep. So you'll you'll definitely know that you're getting bombarded with microwaves because you'll you'll start getting warm. Uh, and it definitely heats deeper than I expected. I didn't think it would go in a, a centimeter in, but that's uh, what that wavelength power is good at. So if we wanted to do a better job, I would have to spend like $300 to buy one of these things. And this is a software defined radio that runs at one megahertz up to six gigahertz. And so this actually has enough sampling bandwidth to see data packets in the Wi-Fi band. Like you can actually see and decode real packets versus the radio I have is like, blah, there's noise. You know, that's really all there is to it. Um, so does anybody have questions about that stuff? Anybody following and understanding why why these things are, are useful? I'm waiting for Chris to blow me up. Go for it, Chris. Fire away. <laughs> no, that that's about that's about my level of like SDR experiments. I I like tune tune the radio, tuned like um, I think the only thing interesting I've ever tuned in on one, and I, I have like kind of the first version that you show, just kind of like it was probably $20, like little USB dongle thing. And um, I decoded some APRS packets. So that was kind of neat, but um, other than that, not really. Um, Chris Wilson, were you the person who gave the talk about um, the tire pressure sensor? Somebody did a, a talk about SDRs and tire that pressure Doug. sensors. So Doug, uh, Doug moved out to uh, Massachusetts, but uh, yeah, he, he had a tire pressure monitoring system on his truck. And he does RF uh, for the military. Um, and so he was really into radio frequency stuff. And he's like, I am going to fake my truck into believing that all of my tires are properly inflated to turn off my dash light. And I'm going to do that all over radio because I don't want to pay for 
he could just put apparently the other one is you take the spare tire in the truck and you take out all the tire pressure monitoring uh things out of each one of the tires and you just put them in the spare tire like you just literally throw them in the spare tire and keep the spare tire inflated and then it's in the vehicle on and then it'll believe that all the tires are inflated properly as long as the spare stays inflated but now they've gotten smarter where they detect whether the vehicle is spinning or the tire is spinning and then they only transmit rf whenever the tires are moving and the car knows that it should only transmit when they're spinning. And so they're, it's a little bit harder to fake because you need to know when the car is spinning uh, in order to transmit the right data packets. But that hack RF that I showed, that thing, what I was getting at with my email saying like um, that software defined radio is pretty interesting. And I think it's kind of the future of radio is the sense that you can push a button on that and you can hit your key fob remote and it will absorb your key fob signal and then it'll retransmit your key fob signal so if you don't have rolling encryption on your key fob to your car, which most of them do now, uh, you can totally do a replay attack. And if anybody unlocks their car within range of your uh, radio frequency device, you can pick it up and replay it. And the same thing for tire pressure monitoring, Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi, all sorts of stuff. Essentially, all of the things that you take for granted that essentially everything but your TV remote and even some TV remotes are RF you could take that device and you could pick up the Wi-Fi or the signal coming off of it and you could replay it or modify it and replay it, um, which is what Chris was talking about is there's a network called APRS that's this kind of packet reporting. Um, and you can totally pick up the over the air packets and, and kind of see it. So so I've got, um, I have the software here, which is kind of why I said I can me uh, share this again real quick. So- I was going to say like another really easy one to snag is if you tune in like FM radio, they also broadcast the name of the song and like the artist as a digital signal that's kind of embedded in the, in the broadcast. And so you can kind of, you can decode that. And uh, that's, that's kind of a cool one. So I'm, I've got this. So this is uh, tuned to 92.1, which was playing music earlier. That was pretty uh, easy to understand and, and to hear. And so you can kind of see we're in the FM band. So our radio is frequency modulated, which is what FM stands for. And so that's why you can kind of see this waveform walking back and forth across the frequency band, because that's what's transmitting our sound for us. So I'll unmute this so you can hear it. So can you guys hear it? Yeah, maybe. So classic radio, and we can drag this around and essentially try to hunt for other signals. I think there's another station over, maybe not. Um, so let me mute this. Uh, so over here, when I drug over here, we got kind of more crap and you can see that there's signals over here, but what I need to do is narrow my bandwidth. So I'm actually like, you can see the blue blob there, the blue line is getting wider and narrower. So we can tune it to only grab some areas of the spectral band and then turn that into audio. So the software is able to do AM, FM, uh, CW is an amateur radio band. I forget what CW stands for. Uh, anyway, it can do different decodings for you. And then um, the other thing we were talking about is where radio has these digital uh, kind of sidebands. Let me see if I get up to. So right here on this one, this sort of block here is actually digital data. And these are the sidebands that are transmitting um, the song that's playing or other data. And in fact, one of the other interesting things is, is occasionally on uh, large radio uh, stations, they'll actually transmit alternative services. So there's a whole nother radio band that shares on top of this radio band that uses the sidebands of high power stations. And so if you're blind, they actually have, um, or, or not blind and just want to listen in, they have talk radio that's sharing spectrum with these other radio stations that is meant for people with disabilities to listen in on so that they have access without a computer to uh, additional media and news and things like that. Uh, and people reading books and all kinds of stuff. So it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of stuff out there. The other thing you can see is there's a whole lot of lines like these vertical lines. Those are other data that's being transmitted but we would have to figure out what the hell they are. Some of them are for frequency locking. So it helps you to tune uh, your radio in your car automatically. So your car will kind of hunt back and forth to, to lock in on the spectrum uh, to give you a really crisp, clear signal. Um, but since we were talking about kind of home automation and stuff, uh, I can drop into 
this is 434 megahertz, uh, which is where your uh, home automation, uh, or um, I should say traditional uh, like weather stations and stuff live. And so if you have a weather station outside your house and you have a temperature uh, thermometer indoors, um, it's actually transmitting on this band. So let me see if I can pause it. So see these little blips, like there's one here and there's one here, there's a blob right here. These blips are data being transmitted from probably neighbors uh, weather stations or uh, alarm signal systems for commercial businesses and buildings. Um, could be a fire alarm system uh, for like Goodman Center. These travel a long ways. Uh, and so these are things that we could decode and we could actually try to figure out what the data was that's there. But uh, that is that is the end of my uh, my spiel. So anybody got any questions, observations, ideas? Yeah, I, do. I do, Chris. Um, could you use that to uh, monitor your utilities, uh, electric and uh, water? And, yeah, so there's better kind of more direct ways to do that. But yes, uh, your utilities are all over the same bands. And so you can see the same data that's being transmitted, uh, either through smart meters or through the, the water system. Yep. Um, and that might be that 434 megahertz signal could be uh, the utilities transmitting data. I don't know. Um, we'd have to look up. You usually got to use the FCC ID on like the smart meter and then figure out what the spectrum is that it's licensed for. And then once you know the spectrum, hope somebody else has already done the work for you and decoded all of it and figured it out. Uh, otherwise, you often need to have um, a device that you can screw with to figure out what the packets mean. Because you need to tell it like, you know, you've got one additional kilowatt. Okay, well, then how did my data packet change? Okay, now you've got two kilowatts. How did my data packet change? Now you've got three kilowatts. How did my data packet change? And then you can reverse engineer the protocol because it's just going to be um either like big endian or little endian um transmitted data with a checksum probably on it uh, and it might be transmitted multiple times it might require an acknowledgement it might not there's all kinds of stuff so uh, it could be encrypted too but it's generally not encrypted uh, not for anything like that mm -hmm. the police use encrypted radio so you can't uh, decrypt their stuff anymore and they mostly use cell phones uh for the same reason because they're automatically encrypted uh, but old school cell phones when a long time ago when cell phones were first out and you had an analog phone anybody with a police uh, uh, monitor could also listen in on any cell phone conversations that were taking place anywhere near them. Uh, so that's still still a thing. Yeah, about a year ago, I was looking into this and I, um, the only reason I didn't follow through on it was because I didn't want to buy the, the SDR. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're cheap now. Okay. I was gonna say 900 megahertz is also a range for where this stuff operates. So like in my house, there's a itron device which hooks up to my water system and like i guess the city must put it in um so if you're looking in that range you might find a lot of stuff as well and that's another uh frequency i was dangling around sector when i was hanging around a lot so uh yeah. fyi <laughs> <laughs> yeah what the other thing that's kind of neat on this is you can yeah there's a ton of shit 900 megahertz um you can also just kind of bounce around on the spectrum um, and see what's out there. And that's where you can look at the FCC's authorized spectrum. And I mean, the FCC keeps track and, and authorizes any device to be on in the US operating. And there is no way around that. Like if you start transmitting off of an FCC authorized frequency and you interfere with anything, someone will hunt you down and figure out where you are. Uh, and because you're transmitting, it's really easy to find you. So if we set up three identical antennas and three identical software defined radios, you could tie them all into the internet. You could bring all the signals together and you could radio triangulate really readily. Uh, in fact, amateur radio operators do a thing called a fox hunt where you hide a little tiny transmitter anywhere. And then you tell people, all right, it's set up, go find it. And that's people will drive around their car with a big antenna sticking out of the roof and they'll do radio direction finding. And if you want to be evil, you'll have your fox transmit periodically and with a really weak signal. And you can make it so it varies. So it might be really strong and then really weak. So it makes radio direction finding much harder because you'll get a really strong signal. And then the next time you may not even be able to hear it. So then you'll like keep traveling. And then all of a sudden you'll hear it again, but now it's weaker than it used to be. Uh, and so you can make it kind of like on expert mode, just like anything else, you can make it harder to hunt down. But if there's a transmitter operating, you can generally find it pretty quickly. And there's better, more automated tools to make that work too than kind of the manual way. They just all cost money. 
Chris, any idea why there's that big swooshy shape <laughs> in the frequency to time? Uh, you know, does the microwave you... like go across <laughs> different frequencies to get different kinds of water or something? I it should be staying to 2.45 gigahertz, but I do not know how a magnetron is running as far as that frequency bandwidth goes. Um, but keep in mind, we're very likely seeing aliasing. And that aliasing can be taking place um, based on the frequency the magnetron's running at, based on the leakage gap. So like the microwave obviously has a tiny gap in it someplace, and that gap actually does uh, frequency shifting. So it may actually shunt off part of the radio frequency and only allow leakage in certain spectra. So I, I don't know. I mean, you need a way better tool. We need an actual um, a tool that's actually designed to work in the 2.4 gigahertz range, not a 1.7 gigahertz tool that's already terrible at 1.7 gigahertz stretched into 2.4 gigahertz through a way overpowered amplifier through an asymmetric antenna. I mean, it's, there's, that we're is. doing all sorts of bad things, but we can see crap in the air. So that's what we're after. Would it experience diffraction if it was just a small hole? Or yeah, no? my understanding. Well, you, what you'd see is it would act like a, a bandpass filter. And so oh, okay. it would shave off spec. Like you may have, you know, you may have a whole bunch of RF inside the case, but the only thing that would leak would be all over the place. Uh, and you also might be seeing multiple leaks aliasing on top of one another. So maybe one is band passing one frequency and other is band passing another frequency. And so now these are firing into the room, bouncing off all the surfaces and then they're refracting. And so now you're seeing the built uh, waveform pattern on the, on the software defined radio building up and, and kind of interfering with itself. So you need a better tool in short to really understand it. But like I said, my goal was, could I see crap happening? And I could definitely see crap happening. So that's kind of what we're after. Oh. Um, How hard would it be to shield against this then? Is it just because the microwave's old or are new microwaves doing this? And yeah, can you build some like Faraday cage style thing around it to block this? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you set up, um, basically if you just put up a, a screen, like literally window screen, aluminum screen, and you built a box around your microwave and you tied that to ground, you'd have zero RF leakage. It's not like magic. It can't go through. I mean, if you, yeah. if you built a true cage, it's not going through it. There's no chance, but yeah, in this case, it's just that there's manufacturing gaps cause they don't care. I mean, it's, it doesn't take a big gap to let it through. And especially too, I mean, it might be too that the magnetron on this thing is just getting old. And so it might be hunting all over the place for frequency. And so it, it might be that it works fine, except, and it's still heating food just fine, but it might be headed towards death. Uh, and it, it therefore might be drifting or deviating all over the place. Um, but the, the best way to understand it would be to put a, a sampling probe inside the microwave and see what the actual RF spectrum looks like, and then put one outside of the microwave and then put one at a distance and understand what are you seeing from which side of the microwave cascading off? And this is all stuff that the FCC does to authorize like the license stuff. Uh, Cause they want to understand like, are you actually working in the frequency you're supposed to be, or are you working all over the place and are you interfering with stuff? And, and you'll see on uh, devices that you buy um, where it's, it's stamped like on a sticker. If you read the little sticker on the bottom, it says that this device must accept any uh, interference. Uh, and that's just to say like, you're going to get interference and this device um, has to be able to deal with that essentially. And that's the device's problem, not the person causing interference. So, yeah. One of the other interesting ones I've never really looked into, but all of the uh, tornado alarms are all set off uh, wirelessly. And uh, I hope that they're encrypted, but I have no idea if they are. So yeah. theoretically you could set up a radio transmit. You could set off all the tornado sirens if they weren't encrypted. I got to imagine they're doing some kind of smart stuff on there, but who knows? Wow. I, I actually got some, something that relates. I've got a handful of like um, cheapy little, like these are like uh, 432 megahertz um, buttons for, for cars and stuff. I'm getting really tired. Um, but I've been looking for a software defined radio that I can that I can hook up to Home Assistant, so I can keep a little thing in my pocket and hit a button and trigger. Um, and I had one on order; it never arrived. But I'm just looking at eBay now, and yeah, 20, 30 bucks. Um, is there a difference, or does it matter if it's point or if it's zero point five ppm or one point oh ppm? Or is that not relevant for something like forty three four hundred and thirty three megahertz? 
So what you want to look at is you want to look at the, the easiest thing to do would be go find somebody's website that has already done this and then just buy whatever one that they bought. Um, Cause the biggest issue that you'll run into is if this tuner can tune into a narrow enough band and fast enough so that you can see your radio frequency and then you can actually get the packets out of it. Cause the, I don't, I'm not sure what the transmitted, you know, data rate is coming out of the thing, but if the data rates really fast, meaning that your reader needs to be fast enough to see it, um, then it might become important that you're able to read the data really quickly. Uh, okay. And so that's kind of what some of those descriptors are talking about is how much bandwidth you can see at any one time, and then how fast you're able to process those samples into uh, readable data. And again, I mean, if, if you only have three buttons, and they all have like really distinctive bit patterns, it may not matter that you can see like the actual bits because you could see like that, that fingerprint. If you're only trying to fingerprint three patterns, it should be pretty readily identifiable. But if you have, want like every bit to be decoded off of the thing, cause you're sending data, then it might become harder. But again, the frequency that you're at is really low compared to what these are capable of. So I got to imagine you wouldn't have any trouble decoding it, but because they're so cheap, the other thing is you could buy one for 20 bucks and find out. But I, I bet if you look around That's online, cool. somebody's got, yeah. uh, got one that they've used to do it. Would the range be different? The this frequency uh, sensitivity has nothing to do with the range of it, right? That's all based on antenna or. <clears throat> uh, no, four four thirty three and four thirty two and four four thirty four. Th those kinds actually do a lot better job penetrating. So like oh, Wi Fi. I mean the the set the <coughs> the, uh, the the point five ppm versus one point ppm. I'm just looking at a couple of them here, and that that's the only oh. really real distinction I see. Yeah, I don't. I'd have to look and see. I'm not sure what's just. I would imagine, yeah, that it's probably. It kind of. It kind of sounds like, um, like oscillator frequency stability or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That that seems to be what it is. It, that wouldn't. That wouldn't really affect range. Yeah, I mean, I think it would have to do with kind of like how, you know, so how accurately it can kind of lock on to a specific frequency that it's broadcasting at. So, so the issue is that the device can drift. And so they're, they're telling you how precise the onboard clock will be generating pulses to read off and therefore transmit data on. Um, okay, it's probably fine. So on your probably receiver, uh, you can, because you're doing software defined radio, you could lock in on uh, the packet that came in and then you can decode it by allowing your software to kind of deal with it. But if you have a fixed transmitter and a decoder, those may be less tolerant of that kind of drifting, depending on how they're written. The other thing I was going to say too, is you could totally get uh, a 400 ish megahertz uh, decoder and just run it into an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi because it'll take the airwaves and turn it into serial data. And that would be like way easier to deal with um, than trying to do all software on software defined radio. But in the same sense, if you do all software on software defined radio, you, you could be way more capable in terms of, you know, it's totally open because it's just software. Because uh, my understanding, you do more programming, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I, you might I, be I would, super comfortable with the software side. I'm not, I, I, just, I just want to plug this thing in and pull a, you know, pull a library off the internet that works with Home Assistant and just have it work. <laughs> like I, I, would do to... a, I would probably do a Pi then to one of those uh, RF decoders, like a yep. receiver. And that, yeah, only... that would, that like would just plug in and work. Um, yeah, cool. My, the only thing I'm trying to figure out there is one that has decent range. And it looks like that would all be based on the antenna that it's attached to. So, and the power, uh, any of these are going to work like way through your house. Like there's no okay. chance. Great. Um, okay. I got to imagine, uh, hang on. I got to clean you. up this evil, uh, stupid, uh, has anybody made a plugin yet that makes it so when you copy text out of your browser, it, it automatically removes all the tracking shit. So you can like copy an eBay yeah. link or copy an Amazon link and it just murders all the garbage that they paste or Google. My God, can you send somebody a Google search? There's no. a Chrome. There's a Chrome extension that that does that. Oh, um, but what if I what if I use Firefox, my first love? Um, there's there's probably a Firefox extension that does it. <laughs> anyway, I pasted into the chat a uh, um, transmitter receiver. That's a pair, but again, you could probably do if you look around, you'll find stuff like that. That's just got like enough keywords you can certainly poke around. But I guarantee there's packaged versions of all that stuff that yeah, people yeah I'm looking I'm looking at like a USB one. Um even though I could do it with GPIO, I just want to I just want to plug it in, have it go. Yeah, I did a Arduino class a long, long, long time ago with these transmitters and receivers. 
But what we did is we reused the receiver, this one that's like unpackaged. And we used, um, uh, it was the push button remote for uh, remote control outlets. So like the, you know, you can buy the little Christmas light outlet kind of things. And it's like two button, turn on, turn off, or like multiple channels. Um, so we used that transmitter and had it talk to an Arduino instead. It's, it's exactly what you're doing. Um, but you could just go to Menards and buy the outlet pair and then get any one of these receivers and then they can decode the same packet data off the transmitter, the little key fob guy. Hmm. So, cause then at that point it's just picking out the right packet and then and decoding. Right. It, but, if it, if it uses the, the same chipset that these drivers are written for, I think it would. Or just... the same frequency and the, yeah, then it should still work, yeah. but you kind of have to play with it, but it's most of this stuff is all cross compatible cause it's all in the same spectrum. And like I, like I pulled up software defined radio, you know, and I showed you guys, I mean, there's a ton of crap that's just flying around out there. Uh, and I'm, I'm minimally 300 feet from the next closest building. And there's more than just like, you know, just our water meter or our smart meter transmitting. I mean, we're seeing, I was seeing packets, you know, every couple of seconds, which means that there's a lot of stuff transmitting and yeah, Matt, you can transmit on software defined radio, but you have to have a transmitter. Uh, so you, a lot of times they'll couple the software defined USB portion of the computer to a transmitter that you can then set the tuning to, because keep in mind the transmitter tuning needs to move whenever you want the transmitter to transmit at different frequencies. So you kind of need buy-in between the transmitter and the computer to control the frequency that you're on. So you kind of need the software defined radio to generate the signal to transmit and the transmitter to be told what frequency to transmit that on. Um, but yeah, you can tie in, a, you can basically make a radio. In fact, they have radio bridges that bridge online now. So you can radio chat with somebody across the world, even though you're talking on literally VoIP. It's, it's like VoIP for old people. Uh, it's, but you're, you're using your radio, but you're connected to the computer and it's just taking the microphone and sending it to somebody around the world. So. But yeah, no, the, uh, Matt, your question is it analog. There's no, there's like the vast majority now of amateur radio radios are all digital. Uh, and they're like, you can USB control them. Like you can plug them into your computer and run, you run the whole radio basically headless from your computer. Um, we're, we're kind of the amateur radio world has finally diverged into like people accepting fully digital stuff. And so all the radios are usually software on your computer. And then it's just got a transmitter that you're plugged into for the fancy stuff. Anyways, you can definitely still get analog stuff. I feel like you've passed over a real important part of this conversation. So you have a microwave that has slowly lost its Faraday cage and become. That's probably working cold. perfect. So as long as you're not a foot away from the microwave while it's on, you're okay. Or at what point are you going to like see this? I mean, why not just like, delete the safety on the door and just like why well, have a door in the microwave right oh if we took the door off we'd have some problems that well, that's they won't, they won't get your food hot anymore not very exactly. well exactly it's a bridge yeah. too far um save the no, stuff so, to open and close the door well so here's the sad part i i gotta go back and buy the radio shack shitty 12 dollar <laughs> detector because that's what does the legal limit it's a it's a wattage per area and so you put that thing on the door seal all the way around the microwave and on all sides of the microwave. And as long as that meter isn't going anywhere, then it's, it's totally legal. And, and okay. by looking online, there are lots and lots and lots of people who complain about their microwave taking out their Wi-Fi. And the solution is you use 5.8 gigahertz uh, and then you don't worry about it because it's 5.8 gigahertz, not 2.4 gigahertz. So it doesn't matter. So you know, the alarm is no longer telling you that you're getting fried with microwaves. <laughs> but, but the thing is, we're not getting fried with microwaves. The leakage is tiny, but that microwave in there is 1,250 watts. And the, uh, the radio on our, on our uh, wireless is like, what, a third of a watt or something? A half watt, I think, is like legal max. So uh, 1,250 watts is like, uh, it's like a semi-truck running over nick on his bicycle like nick on his bicycle is like you know running his mail route delivering all the data all over the, the shop and then this freaking semi just smokes him doesn't even notice it, he got run over and it's like Whoa. still cruising along uh like that's that's what we're talking about power wise i mean it's just 
they're okay. not even close. Here's here's my question. So you buy this this thing, you test the legal limit, and if it fails, <laughs> you have to get a new microwave. Why not do something different? Don't the students get rid of just a ton of microwaves every year, right? Like Aaron knows how to get the free microwaves. And then you just keep plugging in microwaves until one of them isn't a problem. <laughs> oh, Shira, always the consumerist in you. You've never been one to fix things, I know. Oh. <laughs> There's like an infinite supply of free microwaves. Like people throw them away. I have three right now. <laughs> yeah, so the first words out of Jim's mouth was, I have another microwave at home I'd be happy to bring in. Uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. Um, we could totally bring in, uh, just swap out the microwaves. But I wanted to understand, uh, A, I mean, it's the freaking pandemic. I have nothing to do besides, you know, build buildings. And I have to like not build the building constantly in order to keep myself sane. So this was like the 45 minute entertainment kind of getting to do something that wasn't screwing screws together and putting up drywall. Um, but uh, so there's no actual need to do this at all. Cause as you pointing out, yes, we could just go throw away the microwave. That said though, without this tool, there's no way to evaluate the next microwave to find out whether it's any better or not. Well, no, but you could just, you could heat a bunch of food up and see how the expanse season, whatever is right. Well, that's the weird thing is it's, it's intermittent. Uh, you know, you hit, you go in and hit the microwave and like, sometimes you can see on the radio, like the Wi-Fi packets all go away, but the computer like doesn't really respond except for like this meeting. Front, is somebody standing in front of the microwave watching the food? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> like absorbing no. it. Well, so that's the next test is Jim's got these, uh, Jim bought at Swap uh, old lead vests for doing x-rays. So he's going to bring in the lead vest that so we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to cover the microwave and we're going to find out, uh, you know, what's going on with that. But uh, yeah. What about, we'll, the, what about the telco next door? Could that affect your testing? Nah, they don't have any RF, anything. They're all fiber. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, if there was like a cell phone site next door to us, but even that's like not, we'd have to look, I forget what the spectrum is, but it's not, it, it wouldn't be overlapping with Wi-Fi anyway. Um, I mean, you know, we do know 5G causes COVID and I'm happy to go on the record with that. But, you know, aside from, aside from the 5G and the COVID, there's no relationship otherwise to, you know, wiping anything else out. Otherwise we'd all be a lot more motivated to fix it. What's your, um, what's the train signal use? Uh, trains are all, uh, so actually that's getting into a very interesting thing, but so if you want to trigger the railroad, it used to be that all you had to do is take a wire and put it across the tracks and it would set off the track signal. But it turns out that that sets off the track signal way too often because water can get on the railroad ties and then it does enough to trigger the railroad signal. And if the signal drops, it blocks traffic and it's a huge mess. So actually they have, um, a phase signal. And it's constantly being transmitted on the tracks. And uh, when the train approaches, it shorts the phase signal out and it, it shifts the phase. And that is how they detect that the train's coming uh, is by this phase shift on the, on the train. And the train, I believe, is what's transmitting the phases now. Uh, they don't use, uh, so like if you put a wire on the track and ran towards the intersection, it still wouldn't trigger. Because that, that's why the train can like park nearby uh, intersection and they can reopen the intersection to traffic. Even though the train is still there, uh, the train can transmit a signal that says, hey, I'm here, but go ahead and open up to traffic. We aren't going to run anybody over. Hmm. Uh, and that's why they can do that kind of stuff. So, so they figured out what's going on in East Wash because that train track crossing by First Avenue there or whatever is like constantly failing. It's like <laughs> false positive down. Yeah, we had our uh, right out back here. There's a there's one of those the boxes and there's a, a railroad signal, and it just had lights and like all summer long the thing was going off constantly. Uh, and so the guy was out here and I was talking to him and I was like, hey, is there anything I can do to help you like debug this? Because the guy would drive 45 minutes to get here. So somebody would call in and say, hey, the signal isn't working or the signal is working or whatever. And the guy would get in his truck and drive all the way here. And by the time he got here, of course, it had fixed itself. And there's no logging because this thing was built in like 1980. So to, to control the train signals, they have this entire refrigerator box cabinet full of electronics and 90% of it is to block uh, lightning strikes because the lightning strikes the track and it blows up all their electronics. And so they have to have really good lightning protection. Um, so anyway, they spent like the whole month trying to figure this thing out and they finally replaced all the box or all the electronics in the box and fixed it. 
And then like six months later, tore out everything and put in a new uh, gated crossing so they don't have to lay on the horn anymore. Um, so classic, classic spend lots of money trying to fix a thing that's going to get fixed in six months anyway. But hmm. yeah. So yeah, train stuff's kind of weird, but yeah, it's all, uh, it's all wired in the tracks. I imagine you could put a signal uh, probe on the track and see what the phase stuff looks like, but they might get grumpy about that. You got uh, anything to show for all the work you've been doing in the shop? Oh, well, I mean, look at there's a, there's a shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's, shop you said it's working now, right? Usable? Yeah. So the, the wood shop is usable. Uh, and what I did is set up an, the exhaust system and put some big holes through the walls to suck all the air out of the shop outwards so we can make sure that the wood shop stays negative and then um scott and luke finished up the insulation blower and uh with that we're able to insulate the wall that's in the welding shop between where the hvac system sucks all the air in uh, and then distributes through the whole building and so we which was good that we did that because the wall had lots of leaks all over the place which is evidenced by when you blow insulation in and it, and it ends up on the opposite side of the wall that it was supposed to go on because it stuffed the cracks in the little gaps all over the place um and the issue there is that the wood shop is like in its own corner but the welding shop butts up against the machine shop and the machine shop has the air return and when that um air handler turns on you can actually it'll like suck the doors shut in the machine shop because it's pulling so much air in and so the issue is it would draw air in from the welding shop into the air handler and then just redistribute so so long story short insulating the welding shop wall blocks the air infiltration so we can make sure that that room stays under negative pressure. And then I put up a big ass uh, plastic wall on the end of the car bay. So the car bay is also accessible. Um, so yeah, if, if uh, people are looking to do things in the welding shop or the car bay, you can bug me. Um, but uh, yeah. Are you, are you thinking about uh, letting people in as soon as they get back vaccinated? Well, so the vaccination thing is kind of interesting. Um, we have to, uh, so like, say you got vaccinated um, and let's say everybody on this call gets vaccinated except for me. Um, so if I'm not vaccinated, everybody else is. Uh, if I got sick, there's still a 5% chance that one of you would get sick because the vaccine's only 90, let's say 5% effective around 96 ish. And so for 5% of people, it doesn't work. And so if I were sick and I interacted with all of you, uh, there's a chance, a, a decent chance that somebody would get sick. So one of the issues with reopening is that everybody has to be vaccinated because that means that there's only a 5% of a 5% chance of somebody getting sick. So we go from 5% being a pretty big number into 5% of 5% being a tiny number. And that's why the CDC and other uh, agencies are, are kind of pushing out this, hey, just because you got vaccinated, doesn't mean you don't have to socially distance. It doesn't mean you don't have to wear a mask because if you interact with somebody who's sick, you still have a 5% chance of getting sick because the vaccine may not have worked for you. Sorry. Um, that's all right. Well, also you can, you can also transfer it too, right? Well, that's what they don't know yet. Uh, Israel has got the highest vaccine rate in the world. And they're of course using that as an effective means to study and understand is it retransmittable or not? And I believe the latest paper that I read this week is it's trending that if you're vaccinated, you don't appear to be able to retransmit the virus. Um, but they don't know that yet because there's not enough data. So the, the complicated thing is, is if you got vac vaccinated, it doesn't mean you don't get sick anymore. You could still get sick. You just wouldn't get really sick and you wouldn't die. So you could still get like a sniffly nose and a cough. And there's one person who um, they have, he was part of a, a trial. And so he actually got a sniffly nose from the uh, South African variant. So he was fully vaccinated and been vaccinated out like two weeks or whatever. Um, but he still got sick from the South African variant. He just didn't get very sick. So the question is, is if he got a little bit sick, can he be a carrier to transmit to me, for instance, not being vaccinated? So there's some complexity to like, is it, it's not as easy as just saying we have 60% of the people in a room vaccinated, everything's cool. Um, it actually is more complicated than that because there's still risks that are inherent to, to getting together. Um, so it's kind of a, kind of an interesting thing. So does anybody have better things to share on that? 
I'm going to drop a link in the chat from the New York Times from last month. Uh, is it just about underselling the vaccine that I think everything you said was I have no problem with and it was accurate. Um, but they were just saying that like as a public health measure, like we are all being so cautious about how we talk about it, especially with regard to transmission, when really we just don't know, have enough data is the issue. Um, that wasn't a endpoint in the initial trials. And so our being overly cautious about talking about transmission and everything is maybe doing some harm. You know, the fact of the matter is there's no vaccine on the market that is prevents disease, but allows for transmission. And yes, these are new vaccines, but the assumption should be that they will prevent transmission. Um, and we're just waiting to get that data. Um, I read today that they are re-swabbing everyone from the initial Moderna and Pfizer trials and following up with them to, to help with some of the transmission data. So I thought that article was really helpful because I've been like really hedging about the vaccines and talking to like family and friends. And that article made an argument that maybe you could, maybe um, that degree of caution isn't 